So, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me at the back okay? Yes, good stuff, okay. So, a very warm welcome to everyone to this session, looking, as Jude says, at the role of the charity trustee. And then we've got a few kind of extra tips and tools towards the end for you. So, let's have a look, see what we're, where we're going. Roadmap for this morning, then. So, first of all, we're going to look at why people become charity trustees. What actually motivates people to take on the role? Then we're going to look at what being a charity trustee actually means. What does it involve? What does it mean in practice? And then we're going to um, do a wee bit of reflection on our experiences as a regulator on some of the common issues that we often see charity trustees grappling with. And then, as I say, just a few tips and tools um, to help you right at the end. So I'm going to start off then by levelling with you all. I'm going to be really honest here. Being a charity trustee is not plain sailing. And if I'm really honest, at times it can be really, really tough. So the question has to be then, why would you take it on? Why would you become involved? I think that often commitment to the cause, the charity's cause, is the real reason why people become involved. So for example, where the purpose of the charity is maybe close to their heart or it relates um, to their local community. So there's real clear dedication to the reason that the charity exists from, from the charity trustees. And also what the charity is trying to achieve, which is definitely, all of this is really needed by the trustees. And that will mean that they'll be committed and passionate about making a difference and trying to achieve the very purpose for which the charity exists. Okay? So we've got a clear commitment to the cause and to what the charity is aiming to do. But it's also necessary to be really clear, I think, on what comes with being a charity trustee. What are the practical implications of actually taking on the role? So legal duties are the really key thing to bear in mind here. And these are set out in charity law in Scotland. Being a charity trustee carries with it huge responsibility as well as immense rewards. So what we're going to do um, next is a wee bit of a refresher on what the key charity trustee duties are. And as I said, it won't always be easy. There'll be tough times. And you may sometimes, as a charity trustee, even feel like giving up. But when you do, that, when you do feel like that, I would encourage anyone in that situation to just remember the commitment, the enthusiasm, and the passion that they have for the charity's cause. And that should see you through. So let's just take a little bit of time then to be really clear on the basics in terms of who's considered to be a charity trustee, the key principle about collective responsibility and what the legal duties actually are, okay? So, charity law defines charity trustees as those persons who have the general control and management of the administration of the charity. So essentially, these individuals, these are the members of the group that governs the running of the charity, the board. It doesn't really matter what they're called in your charity. So in some cases, they're referred to maybe as a management committee, directors in the case of a company, but the key here is actually the role that they play and what they fulfil in the organisation. They are in control of the organisation. We talked also about the collective responsibility principle. So when we're talking about trustees and governance, this is the really key thing to remember. The principle of collective responsibility, whereby all trustees are responsible for the actions of the charity and all the decisions taken within it. So this really reinforces for me the point that everyone around that board table has to work together. They need to share information and they need to be confident that the decisions that they're making are robust and they can be easily explained if they're challenged on them. I mentioned earlier that trustees have legal duties in law. So as you would expect, these are actions and behaviours that charity trustees have to demonstrate and carry out because these are legal requirements. There's no getting away from that. There's no choice for charity trustees to make about whether they do or do not comply. These rules apply to every charity regardless of the shape and size. Now, some of that might be a wee bit hard for some of you to, to see right at the back, but I'm going to go through these in brief anyway. So what we've got here is that basically duties for charity trustees, we, we tend to say they fall into two categories. We have general duties and we have more specific duties. The general duties are those kind of more towards the left-hand side of that slide, the more specific ones on the right-hand side. 
Don't worry if you can't read that all at the moment. I'm going to go through them um, over the next few slides anyway, OK? So the overarching thing um, to remember for charity trustees, I would say, is that they have to act in the interests of the charity at all times. And in terms of what that comes down to in practice, we have the need to make decisions that are best for the charity, not for the trustees as a group or as individuals, or for any of their friends and family or associated businesses. It's really focusing very clearly on what the charity actually needs. Next, charity trustees have to operate in a manner which is consistent with the charity's purpose at all times. Okay? So stripping that right back to basics, the charity's purposes are obviously what the charity has actually been established to do, okay? And all of the activities that the charity undertakes have to be in advancement of that, of that purpose, in furthering that purpose, be that directly or indirectly. And by indirectly, I mean that some activities might be um, done in order to raise money for the charity to then spend on its charitable activities. So the key thing for charity trustees to make sure they understand here is make sure they understand what the actual purpose is. And I would really recommend going right back to the governing document of the charity here to ensure that there hasn't been any mission creep um, which has unknowingly become common and accepted practice within the charity. So if it's found that the purposes in the governing document maybe are no longer appropriate for the, for the organisation or the situation, then the purpose can be changed by potentially seeking <coughs> consent from Oscar or maybe using a reorganisation scheme, okay? Now, any of you in the room that are charity trustees that haven't looked at your governing document for a very long time, and are maybe thinking it's gathering dust in a cupboard somewhere, I would encourage you maybe for your next charity trustee meeting, dig it out and make sure that you're really confident with what the governing document requires your charity to be doing and what your powers are, so what you can and can't do as well. If I had a pound every time I've dealt with a board of charity trustees that actually have no idea what their governing document is, let alone what it says, I, I would be retiring now. So if you've not dusted it off for a little while, dig it out that cupboard and have a good look. Ensuring um, that the, the charity's um, acting in line with its purposes as well, charity trustees have to act honestly and reasonably in achieving that purpose. And they need to ensure that all the assets of the charity are used for that purpose and nothing else. There can't be any expenditure that doesn't directly or indirectly contribute to the furtherance of the purpose. Okay, so that's pretty common sense, I would think. No, acting with due care and diligence is the next element of the general duties. And sometimes it's a some, um, bit difficult for people to grasp actually what does that really mean in practice. So... Quite often we kind of use the analogy that it's easiest to think about this one as being the standard of care that you would apply if you were dealing with someone else's money, okay, instead of your own. And that's, of course, exactly what charity trustees are actually doing because they're dealing with the funds of the charity and not their own property. And ultimately, that should engender quite careful, considered behaviour on the part of the charity trustees, okay? And in terms of what that then looks like in practice, charity trustees should be protecting the charity, okay, all the assets of the charity, and that very much includes their reputation and focusing on the beneficiaries of the charity. Okay? They also need to have, a, to have good understanding of the financial position of the organisation. Okay? They need to have appropriate information to enable them to make really sound decisions and to act carefully. So in that respect, it's important for them to understand the financial position of their organisation. So, for example, if they're trying to make decisions about what money to spend or what money to invest, they need to understand what position the charity is in financially before they can make that kind of decision properly. Okay? They need to understand the implications of making certain choices. And they can't simply devolve responsibility away um, to maybe just one charity trustee or maybe just say, that's the treasurer's job. Okay, everyone on the board should at least understand the basics of the charity's finances so that they can contribute properly and effectively to discussions and decisions. Okay, and more widely, it's not just finance that trustees need to know and understand, it's also the risks that the charity faces more generally that all charity trustees need to be aware of again so that they can contribute really effectively to decision making in the organization. Now, the third specific duty, um, or general duty, sorry, in law, 
is about conflict of interest, but it's a very specific conflict of interest that this one refers to. And we often use the kind of shorthand as this being the appointment conflict, okay? What this means is that um, charity trustees have a duty to manage appropriately any conflict of interest that exists between the charity and any person or organisation who appoints charity trustees. So that might be a local authority, for instance, okay? But just a word of warning, don't fall into the trap of thinking that that's the only conflict of interest that trustees have to manage appropriately, okay? Just because the appointment conflict, as we, as we term it, is kind of pulled out into a separate duty, any other conflict of interest would also fall under acting in the interests of the charity. So just think about it as charity trustees have to manage conflicts of interest appropriately, almost full stop. It's just that that one is, is pulled out slightly separately. And conflict of interest is an area where we see an awful lot of charity <coughs> trustees getting into a bit of a mess sometimes. And it doesn't really matter what shape or size of organisation we're talking about here. I've seen it in happen in organisations which are really tiny and ones which are very large as well. It can happen wherever, okay? In our guidance and, and good practice for charity trustees, a copy of which you all have on your seats today, there's some really good practical tips for helping um, trustees deal with conflicts of interest. There's a whole section on it. And we, we took that decision to, to write a whole section on it because we know it can be such a problematic area. So essentially, when you're managing conflicts of interest, there are four sort of key steps here. So first is identify, okay? Make sure, as charity trustees, that you're able to easily pick up where there's a conflict or a potential conflict so that you can deal appropriately with the situation. Second, manage. Have a proper procedure so it's really clear how the conflict is actually going to be handled. And make sure that everyone that needs to understand that procedure does so. It's no use having a procedure if no one reads it, no one knows it exists, or people don't understand it. So it needs to be read and understood by everyone. Next, record. Keep a good record of what happens. So even when you're having a trustee meeting, for example, note down that declarations of interest have been asked for, whether any have been declared, and if so, what were the implications for the ensuing discussion? And then learn. Reflect on the experience and make improvements or changes where, where necessary, and that might be to a policy or to a procedure. Don't be complacent. Don't think it can just always stay the same. It might need to change. So let's move on now and have a, a bit of a look at the specific duties. These will be the ones that were on the right-hand side of the slide that we had earlier. So there's five key duties that we're going to cover here. The first is about charity details on the Scottish Charity Register. Okay? There are certain details about each charity that have to appear on the register by law. So these include the name, the principal office and the purposes of the charity. And trustees have to ensure that OSCA is notified of any changes to these details where they do occur and it's our expectation that that notification comes to us on a quite a timely basis, not necessarily three months after it's actually happened. If we don't have, for example, an up-to-date um, contact address for the charity, it becomes difficult, and obviously, in terms of our communication. So it's really important to us to have these details up to date. And many of you also know that there's option for charities to have a, a link on the, to their website on their entry on the Scottish Charity Register plus also a more specific link to where they publish their trustees annual report and their accounts on their website. And if you do have this and you don't have that link currently on our register, I would really encourage you to obviously provide that to us. Because certainly um, having your annual report and accounts on your website, it engenders much greater transparency, both for your own charity, but also for the sector at large. Okay? It contributes, therefore, to that public trust and confidence in the sector that's really important to us all. But also, quite simply, it allows other interested people in your organisation to find out more information about your charity. They might be considering, for example, um, want to volunteer with your organisation, or they might want to donate to your organisation, but they just want a bit more um, information about what you actually do, how you're set up, and that can really help in that situation. Reporting to Oscar's the next one. So this one is about situations where charity law requires trustees to seek consent from OSCA before making certain decisions or taking certain actions. So, for example, making changes to the charity's purposes, 
its name or indeed winding the charity up. All of those things would require prior consent from us before you take the action. We've got really good comprehensive guidance on our website that explains how this works and any of you in that kind of situation or thinking you might be approaching that kind of situation, I would really encourage you to refer to that guidance, okay? So the key thing to remember here is that if you want to do something like changing your name, it doesn't matter how fantastic you think the idea is that you've got for your new name, you need to seek our consent and our permission before you actually go ahead and make that change. Third specific duty there, financial records and reporting. Okay, so every charity, remember, in Scotland is required to keep good accounting records and to prepare a trustee's annual report and accounts that it is externally scrutinised, be that either by an auditor or an independent examiner, which is then submitted to us along with the charity's annual return. And the annual return is obviously now completed online. Now, I'm just going to pause a wee moment here um, and indulge the accountant in me because this, for me, is an area that so many charity trustees seem to be anxious about. And often I see so many boards say, oh, everything to do with money or the budgets or the accounts, that's the treasurer's job. I don't engage in that. And actually, the, re the stark reality is that every charity trustee needs, to, as I said earlier, to have a good le level of understanding of the charity's finances so that when they're making decisions, they can make them on an informed basis, okay? It simply, and I'm going to be quite clear about this, it simply isn't good enough to say you don't understand how much money the charity has, okay? So surely you wouldn't say that about your own finance. So why would you say that as a charity trustee? Next one we're going to look at briefly is fundraising. And clearly, there's been a number of changes in the fundraising arena um, in recent times. It's also an area that's received an awful lot of publicity um, right across the UK in the last few years. Just the key points I want you to bear in mind under this heading is that charity trustees have to take all steps to ensure that the funds that are raised for their charity are properly accounted for, and if they're collected for a very specific purpose, then they can only be used for that purpose and no other purpose, okay? We've now got a dedicated fundraising section on our website, so if you're looking for further information on that area, then have a look on that. And if you, you can't find it, if you're struggling to find it, I checked yesterday, it's on the, the drop-down menu under the About Charities heading. If you hover over that, you'll get a drop-down menu, and it's about sort of two-thirds of the way down there. So if you're looking for a bit more information about fundraising, that's where you're going to find it. The last one here is about providing information to the public. Now, there's a couple of key requirements to remember here. The first one is about being clear on all of your charity's materials that you are a charity, so that means having your legal name and your Scottish charity number clearly displayed. So that applies to your website, to stationery, emails, all that kind of thing, okay? That is a legal requirement. Secondly, there's provision in charity law for any person, any member of the public, to request from a charity a copy of its governing document and its latest set of accounts, okay? So if you receive a request for that information, you have to comply with it, okay? Providing the request is obviously reasonable. And you are allowed to charge the requester for costs of perhaps providing that information. So that might be postage or maybe photocopying, something like that. Well, I'm delighted to have a round of applause so early. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, um, we're actively encouraging um, all charities to publish their annual report and their accounts on their website if they've got a, a website. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing that, then potentially someone who's interested and wants that information has easy access to it anyway. So, let's just pause a minute then. What does all of this then mean? Okay, we've looked at all these legal duties, we've looked at general duties, specific things. What does all that actually mean? So, as I said earlier, being a charity trustee, it can be an immensely rewarding experience. Contributing to a great cause that you are really enthusiastic and passionate about it can give you a lot of satisfaction as an individual, but there will be difficult times. I would say be in no doubt about that. But with your fellow trustees, you can get through those difficult times. You can get through the tricky pieces of work and you can get through those tough discussions, okay? Work together for the very purpose that brought you together in the first place, okay? And remember that when time gets times get tough and remind each other of that as well. 
and be kind to each other in that process too, I would say. I mentioned earlier that I was going to do a little bit of reflection on some of the, the sort of key challenges that we often see trustees struggle with, and I'm going to just take a couple of slides to do that. Conflicts of interest I mentioned earlier, okay? It's got to be the first one I talk about because it is the issue that seems to come up time and time again. And as I said earlier, that is regardless of shape or size of the organisation. Top tips I would say here would be have a conflict of interest policy um, that's really easy to understand. And I've no idea what the, where the noise is coming from now. <laughs> um, have a policy that's really easy to understand um, and make sure that every charity trustee really understands it properly. As we said earlier, it's no good having a policy that's either too complex, um, too difficult to understand, or actually no one's read it anyway. Okay? Make sure the policy is applied in practice. Have proper procedures to deal with conflicts when they arise and manage them appropriately. The next point here is about mission creep. Again, I alluded to this earlier. Bear in mind that when we talked earlier about the charity's governing document, the charity's purpose has to be kept firmly in the minds of charity trustees at all times because they have to act in line with that purpose and in the interest of the charity. So it all flows from the purpose. So make sure that you're not creeping away from what that purpose is as an organisation. Disagreements among charity trustees, another really common thing that we see. I have to tell you that unfortunately I have seen far too many boards of charity trustees um, really kind of just completely fall out with each other, almost at the point where they cannot sit in the same room as each other. They've reached absolute stalemate. And I actually think that's quite a sad situation because ultimately what they all really want to do is what's best for the charity, but they probably just have different views and different ideas about how best to achieve that. And where a board has ended up in that type of situation, I would always really encourage them to try and take a step back to where they were before they fell out and examine what has actually happened to see if they can maybe take a more dispassionate view of the situation and find a way forward. And sometimes an external facilitator or maybe a mediator can be a really, really helpful resource in that situation. And it's potentially going to be a very worthwhile investment if that's the situation that trustees are in. Lastly, I would say that it's really, really easy sorry, for trustees to sometimes lose sight of the importance of good governance in their organisation. Governance has got to be one of those words that you're going to hear time and time again through different events um, over the next two days here. I think sometimes, though, charity trustees, they're understandably, they're so focused on actually what the charity is trying to do in terms of its charitable activities that sometimes they forget about the importance of having really, really robust governance in terms of strong decision-making, comprehensive policies and procedures, and really good oversight and monitoring. And all of that, working well together, helps to protect the charity's reputation and ultimately should make the job of being a charity trustee a wee bit easier. Now, I know you all like some sort of top tips, so the next couple of slides are going to be sort of your top tips to sort of take away with you, okay? So in terms of sort of good decision making, I've got, these are my sort of um, four key tips here. Number one is have the right information on which to base a decision. Don't try and make a decision with only half the information of what you actually need to know. Second one is bear in mind what your governing document says about decision making. How many trustees do you need at a meeting to make a legitimate decision, for instance? Okay, be clear about that. Three is keep a good record of the decisions that you make. You never know when you might need to go back to check when you made a decision um, or maybe some particular detail of the decision that you've taken. And lastly, I would say be prepared to explain the reasoning behind a decision if you're asked, okay? Good governance will actually really equip you to do this because it ensures you have the appropriate information to hand when you're making the decision in the first place. So rounding up sort of the key points then that we've covered here about the role of the trustee. Number one, think about that passion and enthusiasm, okay? Harness it and use it for your benefit as a trustee and for the whole board's benefit. Don't lose it because you're going to need it when times are tough. Secondly, remember your legal duties as charity trustees. Act in the interests of the charity, with due care and diligence, in line with the purposes, and manage the conflicts of interest appropriately. Third, 
challenges. They can be overcome, okay? Don't shy away from them. Don't expect them just to go away or to be solved by other people, okay? Trustees, remember, are the ones with the ultimate responsibility for the organisation. So try to work through the tough times and the challenges. Four, seek help from others when you need it, okay? Don't be nervous about getting help from outside of your organisation because that can be really valuable and it can save you also a lot of time if you're struggling with something internally. Somebody to have a different perspective or a fresh pair of eyes on something can be massively, massively valuable. And lastly, I would say good governance of your charity is absolutely critical. Don't lose sight of it and don't, don't forget how important it is. It's really important, I would say, to keep thinking about how the organisation is functioning as well as actually what it is doing and what it's actually delivering. Think about how it's actually running. Lastly, just a wee reminder of some sort of key tools that we have available um, on our website um, that might actually, uh, might actually help you. So the first thing is guidance and lots of it, okay? In the main, it's in bite-sized chunks um, so that it's quite focused and it's quite to the point. And we try hard um, to use quite simple language that everyone can understand. You don't need a degree, hopefully, to understand the guidance. I would particularly highlight, obviously, the, the document that you all have on your seats today, the Guidance and Good Practice for Charity Trustees. It's got a lot more detail, for instance, about all the legal duties that I've cantered through, and it's got some really good practical sort of um, best practice tips um, for getting your governance spot on. Next would be our smaller booklet. Here it is here, and there's loads of these on our Oscar stand in the exhibition space today, okay? Being a charity in Scotland, it provides a really good quick reference point to understanding the key requirements of being a charity in Scotland, both in terms of the test that you have to meet to come onto the register, and indeed that's the same test that you have to meet to stay on the register, okay? And then the second half of the booklet covers, again, the charity trustee duties, and my particular favourite bit is right in the inside back cover, which I'll not be able to find very quickly now, which is sort of the top 10 key points to running a charity properly, okay? If nothing else, I would say you could photocopy that and put, put it on your pin board in your charity's office if you have one, okay? There's some really valuable stuff there. And finally, our registration logo, which every charity is now able to download from their entry on the Scottish Charity Register. There's a little link you can click on. The logo is a real asset, I would say, for any charity to be able to actually show others that you're a properly registered and regulated organisation. And this ultimately contributes to that public trust and confidence that in the sector we're all so immensely proud of and we all work tirelessly to maintain. Thank you. Right, Jude. <laughs>